mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the EPOC that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. 
at this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the Epoch device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. Hello everyone and welcome to Perf Web 30, day three. I wanna let everybody know that we uh, appreciate you being here and that we're doing this for uh, basically filling the void for all of the meetings that got canceled and all that kind of stuff. Lots but a of lot it. of people think that the Corona 30 programs is because of the coronavirus, COVID-30, but it's not, it's really Corona beer. Okay, I just called it Corona 30 but you can think what you want it's for but really when this is all over with on the on the last day of the corona 30 series i'm drinking myself some <laughs> corona okay i'm probably drinking 30 of them as a That's matter of gross. fact so i want to welcome everybody here to the program before i get started let me go through my housekeeping notes that i have to do every program uh i want to thank our sponsors of course levanova and siemens diagnostics they're both they've both been very generous very helpful please check them out uh, without their support, it'd be very hard to bring you programs like this. Uh, we're on all social media platforms, so make sure you like us, follow us, and share us on the Facebook, the Twitter, and the LinkedIn. And also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We need 5,000 more subscribers today, so please subscribe and give us the thumbs up. No thumbs down, it's not allowed. Give us thumbs up only. And uh, in fact, thumbs up early and often. That's right, open up as many YouTube accounts as you can, right? Keep it coming. And also so subscribe and uh, click the notifications button so that you can get notifications if we go live for some reason and you didn't receive anything in the email, you know we're live at the time. And you can always listen to us, you know? You, may not, you might be in your car and just decide you wanna listen to what we're gonna talk about that day. You're always welcome to do that too. Mow in the yard. Know? Mow in the yard, exactly, whatever it may be. Uh, check out our websites, uh, perfusioneducation.com and perfweb.us. Uh, if you want to join our faculty, if you'd like to be a sponsor, of course, an advertiser, we'd love to have you. We're always looking for those. But if you want to share your story, if you want to share your uh, uh, experience, if you want to lecture about a particular topic that you may be expert in, please reach out to us at contact at perfusioneducation.com and we will absolutely put you on the air and uh you know tell us what your area of expertise is what your passion is maybe a case report or something like that happy to have it and we can discuss it and everyone can learn from each other that's ultimately the goal of this absolutely. whole program that we're doing here nate is to and and all of you in the audience is for people to learn from each other that's how we get better at what right. we do, right? 
We've got the call-in number. If you want to be live on the air, when you see that button there, please feel free. The call-in, the phones are, the phone line is open. You can call in, be live on the air, ask your question. And of course, you can use the YouTube chat feature. You can use the Facebook Messenger or whatever uh, the Twitter has. You can use that as well. Magic is watching the Facebook and the Twitter. I'm watching the YouTube. So we'll do everything we can to make sure we address your questions. Before I get on with the program, however, I wanna talk about, now get your phones out and use your QR code readers. And, and if you don't have that, you can also go to uh, join, uh, to go to slido.com and type in perfwebc30-8. And Patrick is going to be doing, y'all know Patrick O'Toole, of course, uh, is going to be doing a talk incorporating this question into it. Are you scavenging anesthesia gases from the outlet of your oxygenator while on bypass? So you can either use the QR code or go to Slido, Perfweb C30-8, and you can, look, somebody just voted. Did you just vote? <laughs> okay, good. So, so now you see how it works. And clearly we know that he doesn't. We don't even know who it is. It's, full, it's, all, it's anonymous, however, except for today's program. So, uh, and we'll send the notification out about this as well uh, to our email mailing list. Okay, so I've got that done. Let me introduce, however, Nate Bader. Nate is a graduate of the Texas Heart Institute. He graduated in 2003. He's worked in predominantly, or actually exclusively, really, community-based centers, um, and has been here in the Houston area working since 2007. He joined HET in 2017 and since joining us he has become really well versed i think both in ecmo and in crrt thank you and uh Appreciate so that. you know what has your experience with that been since you've been with crt here? or ecmo both well we didn't do a lot of ecmo before at the other places i worked uh none well i'll say one in florence alabama i don't think we even did one when i was at texas heart it's i mean we just didn't do a lot of ecmo mm -hmm. and then joined here in 2017 we had a pretty bad flu season that year and we did a lot of ECMO uh, mm -hmm. he told me when I joined we would do 8 to 12 ECMOs in one flu season and I think from uh, October to December we did over 25 yeah and then we did another 20 or so more before uh, the first half of the year was over yeah so I've picked up a lot and I, I mean, had a vague idea what CRT was just from coming to let's say vague no hands-on experience and uh, learned quite a bit about that since joining here. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to try to push it. Now, that doesn't mean that they, the uh, docs listen to us, but I try to insist on it when we have patients mm -hmm. on ECMO. Because uh, mm -hmm. No, I think it helpful. should be, I think if you're on ECMO, I think it should be on CRT automatically. That's really, that yeah. is really what I think. Yeah. Um, however, and with that said, yesterday my talk was on CVVH and CRT okay. mm -hmm. and I couldn't get through it. So Today's data. talk is supposed to be, and it's going to be, about stroke, TCD, and cerebral embolic protection. But before I get to that, I want to finish my talk okay. from yesterday, which I just simply ran out of time, and talk a little bit about that. So I'm not going to go through all of these slides in the same detail. I'm just going to go through them very quickly in case you watched it yesterday. And if you didn't watch it yesterday, look, you can go back and watch it and then pick up from, right. from, from here where we're going to go. But yesterday we talked a little bit about what it was, what the gap is we're trying to fill. There's the normal, there's dialysis, the normal kidney. That's the area we're trying to work in. I talked about Dr. Ronco, this paper that he wrote. That's Dr. Ronco there. Uh, we talked about his, uh, who he was. This is where I got my passion for this was from him. Uh, he's from Italy. We talked about the study that he did that I watched. It had to do with dosing, 25, 35, or 45 mLs of replacement or effluent or ultrafiltration, however you want to couch it, uh, per, uh, per kilogram per hour. The higher dose seemed to have better survival, as is what is illustrated here. So you can see group one was the lower volume. The, the group three was the higher volume. There was statistical difference between, between statistical difference between one and two, but not between two and three. However, you still can see survival was better with the higher volume. And I think that's because, as I'll go through very quickly again, you're removing more of the bad stuff when you go the higher volume. And that's, I think, very important to do. I don't think it would make one bit of difference for the small 
uh, 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 like electrolytes, creatinine, I don't think it would make any difference at all. But the inflammatory mediators, what is really removed, I think it would make a difference. However, what it's for, renal failure, fluid overload, metabolic derangements, acid-based derangements, inflammatory mediator control, what the mechanisms of action were. We talked about ultrafiltration, diffusive clearance, and convective clearance. And again, I'm going through this very quickly because I did this yesterday. There's diffusion. We talked about that. We talked about ultrafiltration, what that was and what the difference is, and the difference between diffusion. We all know what diffusion is, so I'm not gonna even explain it. Ultrafiltration is when you push or pull on one side, so you're using osmotic pressure, using pressure to force fluid across. That's ultrafiltration. We talked about convection, which is when you use a, a hydrostatic force like that and are pushing or pulling, you're forcing clumps of water across with, and it's able to draw larger molecules across the pore size. Um, because theoretically, if it's the pore size is big enough, the molecule should be able to go through, but that isn't really the case because you have a sieving coefficient, which I'm gonna very briefly talk about again. There's diffusive and convective transport using a hemoconcentrator. The reason it's green on the left is because that's dialysate is there. That's just pure diffusion. On the one on the right, that's a hemoconcentrator. The blood's on one side. On the other side is just uh, uh, pressure. On the blood side, and nothing, no, dif no, no dialysate. And you see the clumps of water being pulled across with the molecules. Uh, we talked about this, and this was very important. If you look over here at our patient, you see our patient, you see the sodium potassium chloride is this, you see albumin total protein and hematocrit is that. When you look at the ultrafiltrate, you'll see that there is no albumin protein or, or, or red blood cells, but what you do see is the sodium is exactly the same, potassium is the same, chloride is exactly the same. This is referred to as isoosmotic. So if you're pulling fluid off of a patient with a hemoconcentrator, your electrolytes, metabolites, will stay exactly the same. But your protein level and hematocrit will come up. But remember, total blood volume will go down. So your patient has to either be fluid overloaded or you have to replace that fluid with right. something to accommodate for that. And how CRRT works is, in the traditional sense with convective clearance, is you're removing and then you're replacing here post hemoconcentration what you want the plasma water to look like. So you're removing plasma water, replacing it with what you want the plasma water to look like. So if you have a solution that has a potassium of four, then you will bring this down to four and yet this will still always be the same as that. Does that make sense to Absolutely. you? Exactly. So it's a very important concept to understand. We talked about adsorption, where molecules, because of a charge, will stick to the membrane itself. So if you look here, you see a semi-permeable membrane. This stuff here is not coming across. You're putting hydrostatic force on it. You're getting some of it across, but look, most of it sticks. Mm -hmm. That is the concept of adsorption, okay? Where things stick to something. And that's really how inflammatory mediators are removed with traditional CVVH, especially when it's not uh, a, a high pore size filter or it is insufficient ultrafiltrate, lower, like 25 cc's per kilo per hour versus 45 cc's per kilo per hour. As you can imagine, the more force you put here, the more likely it'll force the larger molecules across, yeah. but yeah. you're still adsorptive uh, uh, abs adsorption is really the more uh, uh, common way that things are removed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the cytosorb because that's how that works. We talked about the molecular weight cutoff of the more traditional filters, which is 65 KD or 65,000 Daltons. Albumin is 66 KD or 66,000 Daltons, and that's why you don't remove protein right. because the, the cutoff. We talked about sieving coefficient and how important that is to understand when you talk about this. And their sieving coefficient. The molecule is too big to go across the pore. It ain't gonna go. It is, with the, with the other molecule that you see there, it can easily go through, right. okay? And uh, here's another example of that. 
sieving coefficient of one versus a sieving coefficient of zero and what that would look like moving from left to right. So we talked about sieving coefficient. This is just a refresher. I'm going through it very quickly. Now, this slide here is very important because you'll see here, and this is gonna be important to understand. You see, and I need to look at it closer up so I can, I can actually see it myself, but I want you to look at IL, what happened? Move oh, back one. that was me, sorry. Okay, I want you to look at IL6, which is... Middle left. Yep, there it is, it's red. IL, I can barely see it from that distance. There it is, IL6. That's about 22,000 KD, all right? So I want you to see that. And I want you to look at IL4, which is, let's see, where's IL4, guys? Can you help me? Mm, I don't see. We'll look at IL8. IL8, way down here. So IL8 is about, you know, plus or minus 10 KD. Okay, and if you look here, you'll see dialysis, traditional dialysis is in that range, but traditional dialysis will not remove IL-8 and it will not remove IL-6 because it's diffusive clearance because you're right really on the edge of what ions can freely come across. All right, so that's gonna be important to understand. And then here's, you see albumin at 66 KD. And we're, so we're always gonna be under that because the biggest, five, the biggest filters, the ones we use, the hemocores and the, the levonovas, they're 65 KD. That's intentional. Yes, it is intentional. Correct, very intentional. We talked about the balance between the pro and the, the anti-inflammatory mediators that exist. We talked about systemic inflammatory response syndrome and how that occurs. We talked about what a cytokine storm is. We discussed that yesterday and how it affects the, the, the patient. And there's another example of the same thing. And basically, when you have a cytokine storm, you know, well, we'll talk about it in just a second. Here's a basic CRRT circuit. I don't want you to get caught up on the complexity, a seeming complexity of it. We also talked yesterday about why in dialysis, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Nate. When we do cardiopulmonary bypass, we make blue blood red. Mm -hmm. But in dialysis, we take red blood and make it blue. Now we're not deoxygenating it. Mm -hmm. So why is in the dialysis world, these colors reversed from what we in the cardiovascular and perfusion world are used to? <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming it's flow path, but I don't know for, for certain. I'm assuming they're considering that your arterial flow mm -hmm. on the red side and venous on the return, but I honestly don't know. Good guess, but wrong. So with that said, that's a perfusion answer. Exactly. So with that said, if I take a sample of blood from a patient that has a hematocrit of 16 okay. and their PO2 is 90. Uh, and I take, ah, so you got it already. I think, go ahead, keep going. Tell me what you think. No, keep going. No, tell me what you no, think. No, you gotta keep going because I, I may have it backwards. Go ahead, keep going. Okay. And then you take that same sample of blood from that same patient with the same PO2, only the hematocrit is 40. What's the difference in the color of the blood? Which one's darker? Well, the, the lower hematocrit's gonna be darker, right? No, brighter. Backwards, backwards. Brighter, that's it. It's gonna be much, much brighter. It's gonna appear- Because it's really, diluted? Because it's so diluted, right. So in the dialysis world or in the renal world or in the CVVH world, you're taking diluted blood or blood from the patient at whatever that hematocrit is, you're ultra filtrating it and you're returning it more concentrated right. with a higher hematocrit, therefore giving it a darker appearance. So it's literally based on visual. Correct. Appearance. That is what it okay. is based on. Yes, right. that is that is it. So how CVVH works is we remove this isoosmotic fluid and then we replace that plasma water with what we want it to look like here. Now you can do it pre and you can do dialysis at the same time if you want to, but really for the most effective clearances and for removing the largest molecules, the most effective way to do that is post filter replacement. Here's your filter, 
the flow path. This is post filter. You've removed all the plasma water or as much of it as you, you, you have it set for. And then you're replacing it with what you want the plasma water to look like and boom, it goes back into the patient. Very simple concept. Okay, now I can actually get to the second part of the talk, which is that was all from yesterday. And I took an hour to get through that yesterday and I went through this in about five minutes. So forgive me. So does modified ultrafiltration, and we know MUF to be where you come off bypass. So modified ultrafiltration is usually when you're in the operating room, you're still cannulated, you take the volume from the patient, you run it through the hemoconcentrator, you put it back into right. the patient. That's traditional MUF. So it's intraoperative. But does it remove adhesion molecule and cytokine levels after cardiopulmonary bypass with clinical relevance in adults? Is it clinically relevant what we do? So take a look at this graph. This is a very important graph. If you look at IL-6 and IL-8, and this is at normothermia, you'll see that the level of IL-6 was basically nothing, and IL-8 was a little higher in the pre-op phase. You'll see here that at 24 hours, there was a higher level of IL-6 and IL-8 than there was with ultrafiltration. The dark is obviously that ultrafiltrated. And here towards the end, after about six days, a little bit higher IL-6 uh, in the uh, non-ultrafiltrated group, but basically IL-8 was essentially stable and equal at the end of that time. That's an important graph to understand because I have always believed and still do that it clears it i'll tell you why i don't think they found it but we'll talk about that that's a different a different issue so if we look at hypothermia with the same il6 and il8 you can see what the values were pre-op which is essentially equal and then 24 hours after surgery after performing the muff procedure or not which is the ultrafiltration group dark clear, uh, the uh, no no fill or the white is, uh, is non-ultrafiltration. You can see that IL-6 was much higher at 24 hours. IL-8 was much higher at 24 hours if you used uh, hypothermia to do the procedure. But then you see that again, it stabilized. And interestingly enough, IL-8 was a little bit higher in the ultrafiltration group than, uh, than the non-ultrafiltration group at six days. None of this is really very significant. Doesn't There's no fine. big difference, okay? These are very, that's, that's a minimal difference at best. This seems like a pretty big difference, but is it clinically significant is, a, is, 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 is really not. There's some debate, but it's really not. So, oh, sorry about that. So here's another study that was done about the same time. And it had to do with, they looked at blood loss, they looked at transfusions, they looked at a bunch of various things, atrial fibrillation rates, HOSU, hospital stays. Really, it, between the two groups, there just was nothing there. There was no there there. It made no difference between the MUF and the, uh, and the uh, non-MUF or ultrafiltration group. Actually, it's the same study, I, I misspoke, I apologize. But in all of these things that they measured, there was essentially no clinical, clinically significant difference in the patients, okay? Now, moving on to here, elimination. Here's another study. This was the other study. And you can read the conclusions, but they found that polysulfone filters, which is what we use, by the way, because they have polysulfone filters, and they have uh, essentially AN69. It's kind of a nylon polypropylene type of uh, filter material. We have those. But you can see they were more effective at removing uh, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and I would assume, and I think it's reasonable to assume, that this was mostly due to adsorption. We know polysulfone filters are more adsorptive than are the polypropylene filters. Right. Here's a study that was done on the intensity of, uh, of CRRT uh, from the Journal of New England, the New England uh, Journal. And you can see it was a very large study, 4,500 patients, so a whole lot. 
Uh, 2,000 were excluded, 16, almost 1,700 were fully eligible. Some refused uh, uh, the option or being part of the study and 1,500 underwent randomization. They were assigned to higher intensity training or lower intensity training, okay? Go down a little further. You can see what they were, what the criteria or inclusion criteria was. We won't go over those, you know, too deeply. And then we looked at primary and secondary outcomes. Of course, death is probably the most important one, but you also have renal failure, need for, need for uh, continuous dialysis or uh, a chronic dialysis, all of those kinds of things. So renal replacement dependence among survivors. Basically, there was no significant difference at all between the two groups. I wouldn't have guessed that. Well, me either. Here is another randomized trial of continuous versus intermittent dialysis for acute renal failure. And this was Dr. Maida. I think he's out in California. Here's the uh, uh, Apache scores at randomization and what their conclusions were. And basically they concluded that there really was not anything they could point to that said this one was better than the other. Conventional therapy, intermittent dialysis, or there was a benefit to, uh, to using CRRT, okay? Now, commonsensically, I'm just gonna ask you, commonsensically, how do you feel about those two studies? I'm not sure what you're, I mean, I understand the question, but I, I'm not. Well, you intuitively, you said, I wouldn't have believed that. I would have thought, given the benefits that I'm at least thought I was aware of with CRRT. Well, that, how do you think there's benefit? So tell, me what, tell me what it is about your experience that you have a hard time believing those studies. I don't believe them. I mean, I do believe the studies. I think the studies were done. And I think that based on the information, their conclusions were valid, but that's not been my experience. Yeah, it, it, it would seem to me that clearing off those type of in, inflammatory mediator issues and things like that would be as a, a benefit mm -hmm. to the patient, especially for the kidneys mm -hmm. and other things. It may not make a big difference in short-term mortality. Mm -hmm. I don't think it honestly don't know that it would unless you had a huge hit to the kidneys or mm -hmm. other issues, but I would think that it would improve the outcome as far as uh, kidney issues. I mean, I don't, I really know, don't know how to speak on it other than that, mm -hmm. Joe. So no, that's okay. So let me tell you, is, do you think there's any chance that maybe we're just not doing it right? Doing the study correct or doing, no, doing the, the therapy right? The therapy correct. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, there always is that chance. I think there is too. So let me tell you a little something about the studies. Uh -huh. When you really dive into the studies, the biggest criticism I have is that they randomized. However, I'm going to show you a picture. Okay. And I love this picture. I've shown this picture several times. I'm going to show it again, though. I think it's a good picture. Think she looks fluid overloaded? A touch. Touch? Yeah. She's in renal failure too. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the problem with the studies. If you were randomized to intermittent dialysis for therapy and became hemodynamically unstable during the therapy, you were converted to CRRT until you could tolerate going back to, back, going back to intermittent dialysis. However, you're still considered in the, the intermittent arm. So you get, bone, you, get, you get the benefits of both, which is good for the patient, but not for the study. Correct. So, and in the dosing trial, there were nowhere near the volumes that they need to be, in my view. It was run lower. To really, yes, to be effective. Even their high dose was too low. Yeah. They didn't have, they didn't have it. So here's what would happen. This patient, hemodyna grossly fluid overloaded, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that those eyeballs are about to pop, those eyelids. This patient on multiple pressors, hemodynamically unstable, bleeding on top of it, not making any urine, acidotic, 
is randomized to dialysis. Right. The surgeon says, uh, n- 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 you're not doing that. And they put that patient on CRRT. So not only did they go back and forth with the therapeutic modality during the study, changing it, but yet never changing the randomization, the sicker of the patients with CRRT. all got CRRT. <laughs> so is that really a good study? I don't think any, I don't think there's been a study yet on CRRT. I can tell you what my eyes see. I can tell you what my experience has been. Right. And I've, my experience has been that the more aggressive you are with it, the better it works. It, the better it works. And the earlier you implement it, the better it works. But I get pushback all of the time that, well, you know, you're adding risk to the patient. Let me tell you this, work and I've heard this nurse. before. You, huh? We're adding work for the nurse. Well, they don't mind that. The nurses, I think, are all on board. I think the nurses are excited about no, you hear, it. That's, you do hear it from the, from the attendings, though, is that, oh, I'm adding more work for her. I'm not well, that's sure true. If it's, if it's but they have it. a machine now that reduces that workload dramatically and is just as effective as the Prismaflex. It's called the Prismax. I hate Baxter as a company. I don't mind saying it, I'll just say it. I do, I hate them. However, they got a really good tool. There you go. Okay, and for the Prismax is the next generation of the Prismaflex, and it's a really good tool that reduces the nurse's workload tremendously, but yet is equally as effective as what the Prismaflex is. It's pretty good so I think step. it's very important. So let me change that slide because it is really difficult to look at. I feel bad for that lady. Um, so I get a lot of pushback. Let me tell you something. If you're on ECMO, all right, and you are going to put a hemoconcentrator, or not a hemoconcentrator, but a CRRT machine, a real technology, I don't recommend you cut hemoconcentrators in the line. I, I'm very against that because you can't control. Right the effluent, you unclamp it. And if you forget, it's gonna be a problem. Um, it's just uncontrollable. And you, you know, it's very hard to then add replacement fluid. Now, if you were out in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a, war, a, a war zone and you had to do it, yeah, you could do it. But I mean, this is, tr- this is the 21st century right. and we're in the United States of America. It's not a good idea. Use a machine that's designed for it. But if you're on, if you're on ECMO, and you're on six pressors and inotropes, and you're getting transfusions, and you're sick and hemodynamically unstable and acidotic, and you have, you have, you have uh, 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 electrolyte disturbances, adding a CRRT machine to the ECMO is not increasing the- Risk. The, the, no. It's, it's minimal. not increasing the invasiveness. Right. ECMO is about as invasive as you can get. Definitely. It'd be like making the argument, well, we're on ECMO, I I don't wanna add a central line. I mean, that's just how I feel about it. It is so safe, it is so reliable, it is so effective that it should be done automatically. You're on ECMO, you need to be on CRRT. I feel very strong about that, I say it. I know I get a lot of criticism for it, but it's what I truly believe. So let's talk about Cytosorb. Cytosorb is designed specifically. This is a plasma adsorption treatment. Now you put whole blood through it. I'll show you how it works. And this is a, it's, I don't know what the material is. I'm sure it's proprietary, but I'm assuming it's some kind of a charcoal based thing, Uh, but I'm not sure. So don't quote me on that. But you'll see that when your innate and your adaptive immune systems get out of control, and you have first a cytokine storm, which then can lead to shock, but can also lead to essentially immunoparalysis when you have just been in a cytokine storm and then everything just drops to zero. Either direction, you're gonna be in a lot of trouble. To clear those inflammatory mediators, however, much more effectively than you can with CVVH. I think CVVH, if done with high dose, can be beneficial, um, but not nearly as quickly as you can do this. Now, interestingly enough, I heard Baxter has recently come out with a filter that they have, uh, I, I'm assuming they're using heparin, but they have some type of charge on the fibers now, which will adsorb, it gives a charge that will draw these inflammatory mediators to it. Um, I'm not sure of the cost. I know Cytosorb is very expensive 
and you have to use them, I think every day you change them for a period of time. They're about six or 7,000 a treatment. They're not cheap, they're very expensive. But for if you're in cytokine storm, you've got to get those inflammatory meteors out of there. We know what happens. Physiologically, I don't wanna go through all of the, the, the physiology associated with cytokine storm. We all know what it is and it never ends well you got to control it. Yep. So I do think we ought to look more into the side disorder, but I also think you need to look into this new filter that Baxter has. And I don't really know, I don't remember the name of it. I can look it up. Maybe I'll find it but uh, easily. But it's supposed to work very, very well, be more affordable, already integratable into your your already existing CRRT machine. Now, the Cytosorb is very easy to add to a CRRT machine, but you can do a lot of things with it. Let me show you what you can do. So here, this was a video, but I just used an image. You can see that it draws blood from the patient. And again, you're going from red to blue. You're hemoconcentrating it if you want to, or dialyzing it, whichever you prefer. Comes down, goes into the cytosorb filter, goes through. Go, this is just an air deaeration chamber, goes back into the patient. That's choice one. Here's choice two, where you go through the cytosorb filter first, then you ultrafiltrate the plasma water or dialyze it, and then goes into your deaeration chamber and back into the patient. This is just a typical, very simple loop, right? And you can integrate it into your ECMO where you have access coming from the positive side, going into the cytosorb, coming out, going back into the negative side. Now, the, disadvantage, the advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of this is obviously you have positive pressure driving it to negative pressure. That's the first advantage. The two major disadvantages are if this becomes disconnected, right. you're going to deprime this and fill it full of air and it's going to be a fire drill. Uh, the other is you're gonna have some recirculation because you see it coming through going into, I'm oh, sorry, going this way, going into here, and then it's returning. So some of that treated volume will end up coming back out here right. to some degree. And then it goes through your oxygenator here back into the patient. So this is how you easily integrate it into an ECMO circuit. And there's no extra pump needed for that. No extra pump, just all off of pressure, right? Because this is a this is gonna be positive about 240, 200 to 250, and this is gonna be negative about uh, 100 to 150. You may be about to cover this, but can the Baxter device be used in the same manner? The You mean the uh, Prismaflex? The, the, the Baxter filter you were talking about. Well, no, you have to use the CRT machine, okay. not in the same manner. So they're, they're, they are different in that way, okay. yes. And so basically finish off my slides, it's about balance. We want everything to be balanced. We talked yesterday at, ad nauseum about homeostasis. Having the optimal condition of your patient's physiology to have the best chance of survival. When you're acidotic, none of your pressors will work. When you're hyperkalemic, you're gonna have, or, or, or hyponatremic or hypernatremic because you've given bolus after bolus after bolus of bicarb, right. nothing works. You start having cardiac dysrhythmia, you start having all kinds of issues, you start third spacing, you're not control controlling fluid volume well enough. You, you need to keep this collaroncotic pressure higher. You need to keep a higher hematocrit. Really, at the end of the day, what's it about? It's about DO2. And if right. you're massively fluid overloaded and all of your organs are also, you know, anasarca, where you look at a patient and they're mass 30 liters, 20 liters fluid overloaded, they look horrible. But that condition is not simply a visually displeasing sign. Right. All of everything. the end organs are that edematous as well. And you don't get good perfusion because all of the little microcirculatory blood vessels are being occluded by the edematous state. Makes sense? Makes sense. Makes sense to me too. So it's about balance. All right, let's take a two minute break and then I'm gonna do stroke. Or a five minute break. How long do we need? Seven minutes? Seven minutes. I'll be right back in seven minutes.
Go get you, fill your coffee cup or your tea cup, <laughs> as the case may be. Seven minutes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of 
the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to the program. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in to the next right. talk. Do you have any questions about the previous one, by the way, before we get started? No do, questions? Do you, do you have any strategies to push, push is the wrong word, but to, for talking to the, sur not the surgeon, but whoever's, you know, whoever the doc is running the ECMO, uh, Sometimes we are there taking care of that one patient where the doc's busy walking around, or maybe yeah. it's night and mm -hmm. he's not walking around, he's taking mm -hmm. a nap. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, we're talking to the nurses and they're giving us their opinions and we come to the opinion, okay, this patient should be on CRT. Mm -hmm. Do you have any strategies for trying to convince the, the, the attending? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and really, I, I, I really, I don't. Mm -hmm. I think the unfortunate part is, is that there is a, uh, it, 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 there's an insufficient amount of compelling, convincing data um, to uh, to say, hey, look, look, you got to read these papers. These papers right. say it all. Um, I think there are people who are believers who use it well, use it effectively, use it properly, um, and who have very, very good outcomes. And it's maybe it's anecdotal, but it's the experience not necessarily because they were part of a trial, and uh, there are those that aren't. Um, I think that early intervention with everything, earlier intervention with everything, whether it be antivirals, whether it be ECMO, whether Get them on it ECMO. be... <laughs> when you think about it, put them on ECMO. Right, I mean, really, seriously. Yeah. I mean, I think that earlier intervention is always, uh, always better, and uh, you know, I've, I just have too much firsthand experience with CRRT and those that have been with me in those circumstances that have seen it literally turn somebody around uh, and make the difference in, 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 in my view, and I believe it uh, wholeheartedly, the difference between life and death, um, I think that uh, you, become con you become a believer. Uh, but you have to use it properly, you have to use it early, you have to use it, uh, and you have to use it effectively. And just doing it at minimal settings, uh, it's very easy for me to understand why, it, uh, why you would think it just really doesn't do anything, it doesn't really have any real value. Occasionally I see the intensivists uh, passing that off to, and it may be the way it is at that facility, but passing it off to the, to the uh, the kidney doc, I can't think of. The also. nephrologist. Nephrologist. And the nephrologist says, oh, well, they're making urine, that's good enough for me. And right. so they don't want to do it anymore, and the intensivist just takes their word for it, and I'm over there thinking along the th lines you're saying, right. we've got these other issues, and the kidneys aren't clearing 
enough volume to take the lung, you know, to, to help That's this right. guy's lungs dry up. So That's what are right. we doing? And then two days or later, you still have an acidosis, or you're right. still oh, on yeah. pressors. And or two days later, we end up putting them on things. CRT, CRT anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked. Them. Yeah, I've seen that a lot too, where they're just very late in pulling the trigger, and then they're doing dialysis and not convective clearance with it, um, and it all it all matters. But I think that you know it'd be nice if trials could be designed effectively that really did answer the question. Uh, I just think it's very, very, very hard to do. And in some ways it's unethical. How are you gonna take a patient who truly is hemodynamically unstable? And if you put the patient on dialysis, traditional intermittent dialysis, they are going to die. I mean, we know that. We've seen it happen so many times. How are you gonna randomize that patient? You're not, you're gonna put them on CRRT. Right, every time. And so it's uh, very, very difficult. I don't think it's possible to actually do a study that would conclusively answer these questions. Right. And if you're a believer, and I am, you're a believer. Yeah. If you're not, yeah. you're not. Okay, so what is it, Nate, I'm gonna put you on the spot again. What are we here to preserve? When we go on cardiopulmonary bypass on the pump, what is, for, now it's all important, I understand that. But what's the most important, the most sensitive, the biggest worry we have? The brain. Not the, not the face, the brain. The brain. We're worried the about head. the brain. Exactly. Now, if you're Homer, you can get away with a lot. <laughs> but most of us are just slightly, I'm barely slightly larger than that. Okay? Yeah, exactly. I get you. So, we do perfuse the body as a whole. Clearly, we have to be concerned about it. The limbs, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, the gut. The gut, probably the most sensitive, but you know, you can, you can go without blood flow to a limb for quite a while before it's irreversible. You know, the heart can tolerate quite a bit too. Um, the kidneys, eh, they're pretty sensitive. The liver, you know, shock liver generally comes back. But, um, but really, you know, we're there to provide the whole body with good perfusion, but we're just really worried about the brain because it's so sensitive. So if you look here at this photograph, and this is just a hybrid of photographs that I, that I made, various photographs I put together, there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. There are 100 billion neurons in just one human wow. brain. It's a lot of neurons. A lot of connections. And 100 trillion synapses. It's a lot when you think about it. So how do we measure adequacy of perfusion? <laughs> Generally speaking, well, we assume a lot. We do sometimes some fancy calculations. We measure DO2, you know, oh, we're good. Uh, we measure the SVO2, you know, well, you know, we're, our SVO2 is good. We assume from that that we're delivering the right amount of oxygen. Of course, we don't really measure oxygen extraction rate. So, you know, we assume they're extracting the oxygen. The SVO2 is high because we're flowing a lot. Should we flow less? I really don't know the answer to that. Labs, we look at the acid-base balance. If they're not developing acidosis, then we're perfusing enough. But you can, you, can, you can become acidotic through dilutional means. If you're using sodium chloride, you dilute out the bicarb, you become acidotic. That doesn't really mean you're not perfusing. You have DO2. If you're doing, if you're doing muff on pump or you're doing CVVH on pump with replacement and you're using sodium chloride, we've done it before to knock the potassium down, right? So you have a real high K. You ultrafiltrate off a liter, you give a liter of saline. Oh, yeah, having a double. Ultrafiltrate off a liter, give a liter of saline. Well, your bicarb pff, plummets, you become really acidotic, and you have to correct for that. Right. Okay, so you're giving sodium bicarb, you're giving sodium chloride, and now your sodium ends up 150, 156, 160, and now you got a different problem. That's why bicarb based solutions are just way better than our. Uh, acetate-based solutions. That's why we use it for our IK cases. Yeah. It's why we should use it, right, the hyper but I think we should use it for the pump prime. I think we should look at bicarb-based uh, solutions for all of our cases as a traditional prime, not sodium chloride, not plasma light, not lactated ringers. It works, they're all good, but I think bicarb-based solutions are just the better solution to use. Problem is they're just too expensive and they come in five liter bags. Nobody wants to package them in one liter <laughs> bags because of cost. Um, cerebral oximetry. 
The concepts are easy to understand. Making them work in a usable device, however, is not so easy. The big problem with cerebral oximetry devices is that they figure out the saturation from putting a sticker on the forehead that has to go through the skin, the subcutaneous tissue, the muscle, the bone, and then ultimately to the brain and venous versus arterial blood because you're gonna have a mixture. Right. It's not gonna be arterial or venous, it's going to be both. So there's a lot of confounding factors. Each device uses a different approach for delivering light and analyzing the reflection of the light back to it. Each device uses a different approach to compensate for adsorption by the different tissues. That's adsorption of the light, right? We just got through talking, or it's actually absorption, absorption yeah. not adsorption. Now I'm stuck on adsorption. Absorption, it absorbs the light. The analysis algorithm for every device is different from every other device, and no two commercial oximeters measure the same thing. The, the specific algorithm also that's used in for most devices is a secret and the companies keep changing their algorithms and technology so a study done in 2005 may not be applicable in 2013 <laughs> and thus 2020. I think we need to take that seriously into consideration. No device is capable of providing a pure S the saturation brain O2 or SBO2 value for the brain no matter what the promotional literature says. I'm gonna say that one more time. No device is capable of providing a pure SBO2, that's the saturation, the oxygen saturation of the brain, no matter what the promotional literature says. The signal from all devices is contaminated by extracerebral blood. Again, skin, bone, getting through the, the, the fluid right. level, the fluid layer, the cerebrospinal fluid, you have a lot to go through. The dura. Here is an example, and this is very important. If I take a living patient, I'm going to get a cerebral oxygen saturation somewhere within that gray bar but the mean of them is gonna be where the black line is, okay. okay? Now, Nate, if I kill you and measure your cerebral, your cerebral saturation, then you're going to get a value somewhere within that gray bar. <laughs> Which also includes the- With the mean value being with the black. Now, if I kill you and remove your brain, so you have just an empty skull. Well, it's going to be somewhere in that range. You will get a reading. Okay. So cerebral oximetry. There was a really good article that was get done some time ago called "Pumpkin or Patient," <laughs> because they put the cerebral long. oximeter on a pumpkin with a candle in it, and we're getting readings consistent with a living patient. And this study came out of Schwartz. It was written in 1996. So there is, as far as stroke is concerned, because cerebral oximetry is trying to fill a, a need. Right. And that's to help avoid stroke. I, I'm not gonna say I don't believe in cerebral oximetry. I think it is a good device, but I think it has limitations. Okay. I think we need to recognize that it has limitations. It's not perfect. No. But if you are getting a number, you're, if you're using it, you make the decision to use it, and it's on the patient, and your numbers are reading, let's just say 60 and 60, and they pick the heart up to do the CERT graft, and your cerebral oximeter reading on the left side goes to 25, that should raise an alarm. Right. You should be saying something's wrong. Okay. So you're saying use it as a trending device versus an absolute device. Absolutely. I don't think you can get an absolute number. No one can convince me it's an absolute right. number because it isn't an absolute number. Right. But if you're going to use it, then use it. Right. If your pre-op value is 60 and you go on pump and it's now 38 or 40 and your hematocrit is 
18, 20, and you can't flow anymore. Make an adjustment. We don't like to give blood transfusions, but guess what? Yep. I feel you are obligated to give that patient a transfusion. I feel you have a, re a, a responsibility at that point to treat that. Use the if you're gonna use there, it, yeah. then use it. Yep. That's Absolutely. how I feel about that. Encephalopathy, well, let's look at this. Perioperative stroke rates in cardiac surgery range from 1.7 to 2.9%. That's higher, that's pretty high. That's high, you think about it. Think about it, three yeah. out of 100. Three out of 100, so that's going. Yeah. Gonna have a stroke, that's a lot. And it's too high. Encephalopathy rates, however, are much higher, 7.7 to 13.8%. So you come out of the surgery, you wake up, you're confused, you're not doing well, you don't have classic, you have not had a classic stroke, but you are not yourself. So you have encephalopathy that's secondary to what? Was it an embolic stroke? Was it a hypoperfusion stroke? A, a, a hypoxic stroke? I mean, what was it? Do you have hypoxic brain injury? What, what happened during the surgery? Was it a flow issue, oxygenation issue, embolic issue? All are you of asking the above. me or you say, yeah, sorry. Yeah, what is it, I'm asking, yeah, it's flow, asking. I would think that it'd be flow related mostly because of the manipulations we're doing with the heart. Uh, most of our surgeons, all of our surgeons come down on flow and they, if I'm mistaken, all of them want you to come off at that point. Maybe one or two will just want you to come down to minimal flow a liter or whatever. For what? To put it, to put, it, to, to put the clamp, cross clamp on. Oh yeah, or, but that's transient, well, no, that's very but, transient. But, then you have other times when, when we are down for a while because they're trying to, trying to get to a graft that's bleeding or something. Yeah, we've We're had that happen before. Pump. So it'd be a minute or two where you're literally off pump. Um, then maybe your pressures drop and you're not getting good perfusion to the yep. brain. You're getting it elsewhere, but you're not getting it to, good to the brain. Uh, like you talked about, uh, hemodilution, uh, you can have some issues there uh, and some endemitis issues, I'm assuming. Yeah. Same, in the same manner. Yeah. In that way that could cause issues. I think those are very good points. So this, these encephalopathic episodes are much harder to diagnose than a stroke. Can't move one side, you've had a stroke. Your mouth is dropping off of one side, you had a stroke. Um, there's changes can be subtle, can be compatible patients, whatever, but it results usually in, of course, a delay in extubation. So let me take just a minute here to beat on myself <laughs> and my colleagues that may be watching this program, do we, I'll ask you, Nate, do we as a routine have any idea what happens to our case unless we get called back? Absolutely not. No. Do we ever see the patient preoperatively? Extremely rarely. Extremely it is rare. Basically, no, but mm -hmm. once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. Do we see the patient post-op at any time in the ICU unless we're going there to put them on ECMO? transport but we don't really see them long term no. we drop them off we leave That's do it. we go check on them the next day if in i'm in that ICU? facility if i'm if in, you're the facility, in the facility we'll, but but as a general rule we i mean we work in what six six and that's facilities. good that you do if you're in that facility but you might be in a different facility right so no right we I mean, just they, really they, they don't answers, know. no yeah they, right so. <laughs> there shouldn't we shouldn't we be more aware yes I think we should. We should, but there are constraints within our profession that oftentimes won't allow it. For instance, what we're in, we have six facilities that we do arts in. That's true too. That's a good point. It's tough. So stroke is deadly. You have an in threefold increase in mortality at 10 years if you've had a stroke after cardiac surgery. It's debilitating. Most people especially the elderly when they're gonna have heart surgery will tell you they fear stroke worse than death. Very hard, if not impossible, to maintain your independence and enjoy normal, everyday, important activities. Your quality of life is more important than your longevity. And of course, you'll have decreased cognition and mental acuity, and those are really, I mean, think about how fearful that would be. It's also incredibly financially devastating for the patient, for the hospital, because their length of stay is going to be much longer, of course, um, and for society, because now this person is going to require services that they ordinarily would not have acquired, needed, certainly much sooner than they would have needed them, of course. 
So there was this big deal about bashing the pump. Back, going back to 1990, it was the uh, pump head syndrome, right? And it was in the Wall Street Journal. And they blamed the pump for cognitive dysfunction associated with open heart surgery on the heart lung machine. Dr. Stump, of course, came out with the SCADs and how the pump caused that problem. And that was more relevant to bubble oxygenators. I actually think he was probably right, but there's other things. Blood air interface and the right. suctions causes you to have these protein bubbles, that uh, coated bubbles that will never dissipate and they become embolic in nature. Um, and of course, off pump, that was the launch of off pump. That's what created the whole off pump craze. And in this article, off pump versus on pump coronary artery bypass grafting, big study, 4,700 patients. You can see here the first uh, primary outcomes at 30 days. And what do you see? You see off pump and on pump stroke, exactly the same. You see death, exactly the same. You see non-fatal MI uh, a little higher in the on pump group, and you see new renal fa failure, basically the same. So the big problem was that your revascularization wasn't as good. Wasn't as good. Your need for another intervention was much higher. So there was no real benefit. Now, at 30 days, basically you could see there was really no difference. But off pump was associated with less transfusions and reoperation for bleeding. There was slightly less acute kidney injury. There was less respiratory infections and failure and more early, again, need for revascularizations. That's the downside, that's not a benefit, okay? <laughs> it was associated with more early need for revascularization. So that's that information. So it isn't the pump. <laughs> now I want you to soak this in if you're watching at home and I want you to just think about it for a minute, okay? Just think about it. Okay, that's probably long enough. <laughs> If you're not traumatized before, you're traumatized now. Taver and stroke has been an awakening. It occurs, a stroke occurs during a tower. Wow, I did not know that. 100% of the time. And I will contend to you that stroke occurs in cardiac surgery 100% of the time. Do you mean on bypass or in yep. general? Heart surgery, open heart surgery. That's what I was asking. On, and on pump, off, off pump, pump, I don't care. Stroke occurs 100% of the time with TAVR. It occurs 100% of the time with, uh, with uh, uh, open heart surgery. The majority of these strokes are embolic. All strokes are consequential. And cerebral embolic protection device investigations and industry has been launched because of this very real problem. Now. Where it gets a little bit confusing is how do you define a stroke? Because I said a stroke occurs 100% of the time. Who's gonna to wanna to have heart surgery? Right. Who's gonna to wanna to have a TAVR? It's all in the definition. Stroke has always been what we consider to be the obvious signs. You're stroked. Right. They're laying in the bed, you have a hemiparesis, it's obvious they have had a stroke. However, that's a class one stroke. A number of years ago, they came out with classes of strokes. Class one, the overt. Class two is any new lesion under diffusion weighted MRI of the brain. And that's what you see there. The hyperluminosities are basically embolic strokes. Now, they may not be clinically relevant or clinically obvious. You may not see it but today. Right. But if there's a billion neurons in that brain, how many hundreds of thousands do you think are now gone with those embolic events? A bunch. A bunch. A bunch. The brain's pretty remarkable. 
But those areas of the brain are dead neurons, dead synapses. They're not going to work. It has to get rerouted. And if it just hits the right spot, you start having that memory fade. Right. You start changing your personality a little bit, remembering things quite the same way. Every single embolic event to the brain is consequential. Makes sense. We need to start understanding that and accepting that as a reality and doing something to fix it. We don't do anything to fix it. So these new industries have been launched. Take a look at this. This is a cerebral embolic protection device. No, that's not. This is a tavern. I lied. This is a tavern. You see it going in. You see how it's staying central lumen. They just dilated the balloon. It all looks great, right? Except for the embolic shower from the... Well, let's watch. <laughs> let's watch. Look, here comes the valve. It's going to come up. They're going to change it over. Look at how perfect that is. Look at that beautiful aorta. Look at how it's right smack in the middle. Goes around so perfectly. Goes into place. New valve is deployed. And it's going to happen. There it goes. Do the rapid pacing and deploy it. Look at how beautiful that looks. Okay. So what's the reality? Well, the reality is as that thing is going up the aorta and starting to make that turn around the arch, it's banging against that superior wall of the aorta. And it's breaking off pieces of athroma, calcification, tissue, whatever else is getting knocked off as it comes around. And you can see it on the, the lateral aspect of the aorta down by the sinotubular junction. You can see it, I'm sure, right there in that, in that in A. Then it goes in, and as you're passing it through and dilating the valve to implant it, you see you have another massive shower. And then as you take it out and it just sits there for a little while, it's still gonna be some residual showering take place. What effect did that have? Now, you have this device. This is the Sentinel device. It's put in through the axillary artery and it one stays in the anominate and the other one goes up into the, uh, uh, into the uh, left carotid. And what that does is actually captures any embolic material that goes up. Now, the limitation of it is there's nothing in the left subclavian, and of course, the vertebral comes off the left subclavian, so you still have some risk. You also have risk putting it in, because if you put it in, you will also have a shower of some embolic material. But will it be the same load as it would be putting that big tavern in? Look, again, Barring a large trial, and I know the trials are being done with this and they're looking at stroke mitigation and does it really work and all of that kind of stuff. I'm a common sense kind of guy. It just makes sense. To use that. It just makes sense. It just makes sense. Period. So, you so know, there's, 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 there's statistics. What, how does that saying go? What did Mark Twain say? Lies. Statistics, li no, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah, exactly. So real quick before you go to the next slide, let me ask you this, and you may cover this later. What are your feelings as, it, as to similar devices that don't, apply, don't deploy in there, but they deploy, they deploy in the aorta that are made for pump runs? Absolutely. I think that, yes, I, I'm not going to cover it. It was going to be part of the discussion, and I think we should discuss okay. it. Uh, but I think it's a very good point. So write that down so that I don't forget to discuss it because I think that is a very good point. And I'm not sure that it wouldn't make sense to just use this device. So back to the pump. Not all strokes are caused by the pump. We know that. But the pump is not free of stroke risk from hypoperfusion, from embolic gas or particulate, from hypocarbia, gross hypocarbia, uh, because you know CO2 really controls cerebral perfusion. Right. You can get your CO2 low enough and restrict cerebral blood flow by 50% if you get your, your PCO2 down, let's say, to 20. Yeah. And I've had it happen to me before. I've had it happen. And so, you know, and it's concerning. You had a, con you had a confirmed stroke or you had a... Con your, your no, I just had a CO2 that low. 
and fixed it right away, but it, it right. made me a little nervous, disconcerting. Disconcerting, certainly. We know that clamping and unclamping the aorta are embolic. Right. We know that. Absolutely. You remember the days of the uh, embolex catheter? Yeah. They would find debris in that thing every single time they sent it in. And frequently we saw huge chunks in it, okay? Um, is the heart position effectively affecting the flow or generating emboli. So I think what I'm trying to say there is when they pull the heart over and change Absolutely. the cannula position and it's Absolutely. jetting against the aortic wall, what does that cause and what's happening or there? Or if you're just, if your cannulation site is right next to a plaque that you didn't know was there. Because not everybody checks the, the aorta with the, with with the, the ultrasound. The, with the ultrasound, right. Do we know if the pump sucker is causing emboli? Absolutely. As in the case of, uh, uh, of Dr. Stump. Do we know if the flow is adequate for cerebral perfusion? Oh, I know what I was asking in that, in that first one. Is the heart position affecting flow? In other words, are we flowing well enough to the brain? Right. I think that's where I was going with that. Excuse me. Um, do we know if the flow is adequate for cerebral perfusion? Do we know if VAD or kinetic assist has an effect on embolic events? Does a dry venous line have an effect? If you go on with the dry venous line, reduce hemodilution. I used to do it, I did it for years. Um, but does it generate more gas microemboli? I don't, I can't imagine it does, but I really don't know, uh, but I don't think it does. Is a closed system better than an open system? There's still a lot of people that use bags. I don't know the answer to that either. When we go down on the flow, does it matter if we clamp the line or does it matter if we turn the flow down? I'd like to get your opinion on that one in particular. Me too. Does, What's your opinion, though? I'm does sorry. pulsing have an effect on flow or generating emboli? That's another question. And are our temperature gradients during cooling and warming really safe? That's a good. That's a big one. I, mean, don't I don't know, know about. I don't know about stroke wise, but I, I I've had that thought before because a lot of times our surgeons will drift, and then they say rewarm. Well, it's a big patient. I mean, it's a 115 kilo patient, and I know that he's got two proximals. Well, to rewarm, I got to scramble. I got to be cranked wide open and we're starting at 30 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and these rooms are cold in some cases really cold. And so it takes quite a bit to rewarm that patient. So I've got my, my water temp cranked. There's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise at the end they're sitting on there waiting on me and mm -hmm. they're looking at me going, did you start rewarming when I rewarm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I told you 10 minutes or asked you 10 minutes before mm -hmm. that for a reason. Mm -hmm. Anyways, yeah. Sorry. We probably shouldn't <laughs> do that, but the brain is very sensitive to hypoxia. It auto-regulates. You've got the cerebral perfusion pressure and you have CO2 to control it. It weighs about 1,300 to 1,400 grams, takes 15% oh, of the cardiac output, which is about 50 to 55 mLs per 100 grams of brain matter. Has this very conveniently positioned vascular system. So compared to the heart at four to 5% of cardiac output, having your, you know, in terms of the brain, ha the cerebral perfusion pressure, however, outside of 60 to 160 millimeters of uh, mercury pressure, autoregulation is lost. If you breathe 5% CO2, and we used to use 95.5 on our pumps back in the old days, but if you breathe 5% CO2, so 95% oxygen, 5% CO2, you will increase your CO2 and your cerebral blood flow by 100%. Really? And basically engorge your brain. It's bad for you. You should not do it. No, I'm just- I'm Breathing just, CO2 just, is bad. It's a giant difference is what I was getting at. Not That's that you right. should do it or shouldn't. But. A PCO2 on the other hand of 28 will result in a decrease in cerebral blood flow between 12 and 24 milliliters per 100 grams. Now it's 50 to 55 millimeters per 100 grams normally. So you could reduce it just with a PCO2 of 28 by 50%. That's significant. Significant. Because I was like freaking out when my PCO2 is 20. Right. I can't imagine what I was doing. But how many times do we just accept a PCO2 of 28? I've seen it many times. I have. I mean, it, it, I don't do like do it, it, but I deal with it. Right, we do it. We I don't do get it. that worried about it. Maybe yeah. I should. Maybe you should. 
Here's basically cerebral uh, uh, anatomy, cerebral blood flow anatomy. We're all familiar with it. I won't go over it too much. Transcranial Doppler. Transcranial Doppler takes advantage of the middle cerebral artery, which is what you're seeing there. And it looks at it, the one coming to it, and the one going away from it on the contralateral side. And you can tell on the TCD device, if it's red, it's coming to you. If it's blue, it's going away from you, right? You could have two channels. Bob Groom, and I've talked about this before, had been talking about cerebral oximetry for a very long time. This was written up in 2009. Um, so 11 years ago, and even before that he was talking about it, but he was showing how TCD and they would change things on the pump. He would give uh, medication. They would see a bump up in the TCD, in the embolic events. He would do tap the line and there would be, now that wasn't artifact because you can tell artifact from that. You would see a shower of embolic material probably air that was hung up in connectors. There was something somewhere, Right. okay? So he's been advocating the use of TCD for many, many years. How can perfusionists be a part of this solution? Well, I think TCD just makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna show you there are some newer technologies because the old style TCD, you have to put this thing on the head and you have to sort of aim it and it's challenging and it takes some skill and it's labor intensive there are some issues associated with it. And you're dealing with real estate. I'm gonna show you an image of why I think there may be a limitation to this. But it's a, there are some newer technologies that are easier to use. They do have billing codes, so it does help as far as payments are concerned. Can help determine if there was a problem. It can't prevent a problem on that case. And I know I hear this argument all the time. Well, what do you, I mean, it's already happened. What's the point? I'll tell you the point. So it goes, it goes to what you just got through saying. Exactly. We're going to talk about that. It's highly specific to both flow and embolic events. So it will show you whether or not you have good flow through the middle cerebral artery. You can see it. If your cerebral perfusion pressure, if you don't have a good opening pressure and it's clamped down, it's not opening. Not getting flow. You don't have flow. You know it. Okay. Can help change your practice can be easily learned by perfusion, can become a tool for perfusion to improve our outcomes, reduce our stroke. And I think we should just get more involved and know what has happened to your patients. I think that's important to know. Here's that new technology I talked about. It's the Lucid Robotic Transcranial Doppler. Now I call, I reached out to this company and asked them via email if they would be willing to participate in the program and talk about this thing, but they, were, they have never re re responded. So I've gotten no response from them. However, in the future, you know, if you're watching this Lucid and you want to be involved in this, would love to hear from Definitely. you. But this is a robotic and automated device, which is a lot easier than the old style TCDs. However, and with that said, you notice you're occupying a lot of real estate. That's going to be in the way of anesthesia. Absolutely. For this to be adopted into routine cardiac surgery, it's going to require that being a whole lot smaller right. and a whole lot easier to use. Right away. I think that's the issue that I have with it. But I think it's, it's brilliant and I think it needs to be done. So as Don Remsfeld said, there are known knowns. And there are things that is, these are things we know that we know. There are unknown, or known unknowns rather, that is to say there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't even know we don't know. And that's, I think, the thing about cerebral blood flow when we're on pump. There's just so much we don't even no, know that we don't know. But it's something I think we need to really start paying attention to. So here's a good friend of mine, Dr. Zolt Garami. He's kind of the guy that got me involved, you know, sort of excited about TCD. Uh, brilliant guy, works with NASA, uh, is really an expert. He's gave, given a lecture here on TCD okay. before at a couple of the conferences that I've had. Would love to have him more involved in this and back because I think TCD is a tool for perfusion that we should be using more of. 
and I think that perfusionists around the globe should become more involved in understanding stroke, stroke mitigation, and how we contribute to strokes as perfusionists. So you can open the phone lines, we'll have our discussion. Let's have the first thing, what you had mentioned to me. So let's talk about changing your practice. Okay. Uh, rephrase that question, let me start there. When you okay. say changing your practice. So let me ask you this. When the surgeon says to you, come down on your flow, he's gonna put the clamp on. Right. Come down on your flow, what do you do? Generally, I partially clamp the line. Okay. There are times when I'll, hands are busy, I'm doing other things, it could, because it always happens when I'm doing other things, whether it's coming on, clamp on, clamp off. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are times when I clamp the whole line. Mm -hmm. But generally I try, and I've actually changed now lately to uh, trying to bring the, the pump flows down as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now let me ask you a question. When you're shooting water through a line, and you take a clamp and you're flowing five liters a minute of just saline, pumping it out into the air, and you take a clamp Absolutely. and you clamp across it. You're not having a nice linear flow. I know what you're saying. What happens to that pressure at the end of the line? Say that it, wait, the pressure the outflow, at the end of the line, it's, yeah, the it outflow. Reduced, it's, but it, how, does it, how, does it, how does it behave? You're not having a nice streamlined linear flow if that's what you're asking. Well, or, when you clamp it, just acutely to clamp it. Just it stops, I see what you're it saying. It just yeah. stops. Absolutely. And it, woof, you feel that pressure drop. And if you're going through a cannula in the aorta, flowing five liters a minute, and I just reach over and clamp the arterial line, yeah. and that thing, pressure drops, and it has that, that, that little, little reverberation we see, mm -hmm. how much, how much, how much emboli, emboli are being caused there? And then you reach over and you pop the clamp off mm -hmm. and you woof, right back up to five liters. If every time you did that and you were using cerebral oximetry and you saw major embolic events occur, but when you turn the flow down by reducing the, the, the RPMs of the pump, the rheostat control, and then coming back up, you didn't see that, would you change your practice? Yeah. You would, because yeah. you'd have proof. Yeah, you yeah. have proof. Does yeah. it happen? I don't know. I would love to test the hypothesis. I, I, I would, would love to test it. I would lean toward yes, but again, we don't have proof of that. We don't. We don't have proof. But absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Correct. So we're now confronted with that. I think it matters. But I've also been in the same situation you are. Flow down, <laughs> clamp. They want the flow down. Right. I understand that. Maybe we need to be, more, maybe they need to be more aware. What if you think the surgeons knew that every time you did that, something bad happened, would they be more likely or less likely to be more patient? Absolutely more likely. Without more likely. question, they would be more likely to be patient. Now, having said that, some of our, some of our surgeons are, they don't wanna know because they just wanna keep going because they're that fast and they wanna maintain that. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they have good outcomes. And they have good out. That's actually that's. They have know, good the outcomes. The way I said it before wasn't fair. Saying the way you said it, they have good outcomes, and that's that's yeah. a more fair way to say it. That's okay. I'm here to help you. You can help me too. <laughs> yeah, they all have great outcomes. Fantastic. We all do exactly, exactly. But I think it's something we should be more aware of. I would love to know. I would love to put, you know, put a model you know, on bypass, somehow be able to measure, you know, because it'd be better if it was blood, so it'd be better if we were using an animal model and, and, and be monitoring uh, TCD and clamp the line, re release the line, clamp the line, release the line at five liters a minute and see what happened versus turning the flow up and down. It may be just as bad. I really don't know. I wouldn't think, it, I mean, yes, it may be. But I wouldn't think it would be because we are literally talking, like you said, you're completely constrained. Five meters to that. zero, five to zero. Five to zero. And then on the other side, even though mm -hmm. they say come up slow, you know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're not, they say come up slow, you're taking that clamp off. So even if you bring your RPMs down, you're still getting a sudden resurge there of flow. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions? Mm. 
Not Anything really. from Facebook? No. No? Any questions? Uh, no, I did want to ask. Have you something today? You got yes, a question to ask? We were talking about the anti-embolic devices, devices for CPV. Yes. Oh, yes. So wouldn't it be something if we put that in, I mean, you know, in our, I mean, they had the Embolex catheter. That's come off the market. What was the reason but, for it to come off the market? The reason, the stated reason was because it was coated with heparin and that it didn't have the proper FDA approval because it was technically then a drug and, or drug in a drug, a drug eluding. Right. And it had to go through a different set of, um, of uh, scrutiny by the FDA. And Edward said, we're not spending the money on it. And they just took it off Because the it's implanted. Technically, it's no, it, no, it's just because box. it was no, just because it had heparin on it. If it didn't have hep, have heparin on it, then it wouldn't have been an issue. That its approval was not based on it having a heparin coating. Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, that's yeah. what I heard. No, I don't right. know if that's true, but that's that's. I don't know if it was that or, or if it was because it created its own series of issues. No, so so they took it off the market. Okay. But studies didn't really show a stroke reduction benefit with it. Um, interestingly enough, even though there, I mean, I don't know how that's possible. That's but what I was thinking because you see I a lot of big images. Chunks. I have pictures yeah. of it with big chunks. How, that would have that would have been you would have been toast. Right. You would have been toast. So I don't understand that. You know, I can't quite figure it out. But it is what it is. I think that either there's two different ones. I showed you the uh, the Sentinel, the clarinet um, uh, one, or the Sentinel claret claret. And then there's another one that's, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it basically covers all three of the arch vessels. But that is an embolic collection device. This one is a deflector. And it's essentially a net that goes around the aorta uh, where the arch vessels are, all three. And then anything that hits it will go downstream to where hope it wouldn't do as much harm. Right, right. Um, so, uh, so that's how that works. Okay. So there's two out there. I, I, I uh, to some degree, think they should be used routinely in cardiac surgery. But again, you know, we are a, we are an evidence-based, you know, study addicted society that feels that we have to have data that is conclusive in Proof order to be works. able to write to say that we should do this you know i you know i'm not a physician and i understand that there are perhaps differences in in because of that but i'm kind of a commonsensical guy i, I see the risk benefit heavily outweighed or outweighing using it in a positive way as opposed to not using it right. given how high our stroke rate really is i mean for an isolated aortic valve it's five to seven percent when when you it's talk very high when you talk to these surgeons and i know you speak to them a lot more than we do and as far as this kind of stuff Not really do you, well you do well just because i'm interested in it. right so do you do you talk to them about this kind of thing you know would you use this type of device if it was available and if so what do they tell you like the reason why i asked i asked specifically one surgeon i won't say his name but I asked one surgeon uh, in this area, this device, you, you know, I've seen this before. I saw it at one of the meetings and, and he honestly said, my outcomes are good. Why would I change anything? Mm -hmm. Why would I change anything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, why would I, it, it doesn't do, it won't do any good. That's mm -hmm. what his answers were. And mm -hmm. he is a, I can speak for the guy to say that he's a very data driven person. Yeah. So I think he probably has good enough outcomes that he feels that he doesn't need it. It's, it's mm -hmm. an honest, yeah. Feeling, but and what is good enough? I mean, then that becomes a separate issue. What is what is good enough? Is a stroke rate of one of two point nine percent is that good enough? Is I mean, I, I, I if not, if you're one of the two point nine percent, not if you're one of the three out of hundred, you know, 100 correct. So yes, we are a data driven society. We have to have study after study after study that is conclusive, and then it has to be labeled as a 1A recommendation by the STS before it ever gets done. Right. And that takes years and years and years and years and years. I, I, you know, I'm more of a, this makes a lot of sense. Right, we, we not in the same vein, but we had a similar discussion with a surgeon locally. Uh, I told him we had all went over the, the uh, 
the AMSAC guidelines and, yes. and reading the guidelines and see what's going on. How we, you know, how can we change our practice because we kind of have a slowdown mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So, I, mm -hmm. one of them was the sucker. You know, turning mm -hmm. the sucker off as soon as we start, as soon as we start protamine. So what I, you know, I said, he's leave the sucker on. I said, you know, this is a shall. This is something we should do. And his honest to goodness answer was, I didn't, I didn't say I'd do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, well, we mm -hmm. leave it on. Mm -hmm. So that's, I'm just saying, that's how they, yeah. a lot of times, that's how they feel. Why am I changing yeah. anything? I haven't had that issue before. Yeah. I've never clouded off There's the no benefit to leaving the pump sucker on. There's none. There's none. And I just fundamentally. No, I'm just using that as an example I, no, to I'm say they're not going to change. No, let's because, talk about that yeah, now. Good, so you go went down the rabbit hole, so let's just go down the <laughs> rabbit hole. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. To leave none. it on. Even if you lost a couple of hundred cc's, you're never going to get it back from the pump and you're running the risk of clotting your plump off. Just use the cell saver. I have a much better chance of giving those red cells back to the patient sure. than I do if you put it over here. Um, I turn the pump suckers off as soon as the protamine is in somebody's hand. As soon as I hear the word, I hear the P <laughs> right. and they don't get to the in part and I've already got it off. I'm not doing this. I've had the pump clot off on me twice. Yeah. And you only have to have it happen once but to have it happen twice in a career, I've been doing this a long time, you don't want that experience. And it's, you know, one was because protomy was given without telling anyone it was being given. That's a bad day. Yeah, that was a bad day. And we had to go back on pump. Oh, that's a really bad day. So that was that disaster. The other one had to do with what you're talking about. Leave the suckers on, leave the suckers on, leave the suckers on. I'm like, you know, till they had 50% of the protamine in, and then we had to go back on pump, and the pump was clotted off. Yeah. So, I, you know, you, you, you don't have to have it happen to you very often. So I've actually physically had it happen at, in as my professional practice, my professional career, where the pump has clotted off because they left the, the, the suckers running while the protamine was being administered. No more, I won't do it. Yeah, what, what I tend to do in those instances, and I wasn't trying to go down the rab this rabbit hole, I was just using an example, but what I tend to do in those instances are if I feel that we're getting close to that kind of situation, I just add some heparin, so mm -hmm. I'm ready. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and generally, our cell savers are really good at removing mm -hmm. that. You probably add the heparin like that, but that's good. Well, take the cat. It just depends on how you do it. <laughs> Actually, I've gotten back into using syringe, so you're good. right. You're good. <laughs> All right, good. So, uh, so with that said, um, if there's no other questions or comments, we're going to end a little early, All if right. that's okay with everybody. No. You have some, some, uh, some, uh, 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 some beef tacos to make? <laughs> Not tonight. Or to bring me? Not tonight. Apparently, they're all gone. It takes hours, but yeah, it was delicious. It was delicious? <laughs> Jay, uh, 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 Nate is a, you are truly a gastronomic genius <laughs> i wouldn't go that far it's good food but it's no not you do you are a foodie you i'm a foodie. foodie i am a foodie but that doesn't mean that i'm the genius i just know like you cook others. it too <laughs> but he takes me to a restaurant he took me to a restaurant one time i'll never go with him again he was loving this stuff i don't know what it was but it was horrible okay it was horrible let me tell you right now can i say the name of the restaurant so i can give it to everybody sure pele pele it's awesome pele pele okay so if y'all are in Houston and want to go to a restaurant when they open, I guess, yeah, if they're still they open, open, go to Pele Pele if you like that kind of food. <laughs> Way too sophisticated for my blood. But we'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have John Ingram on the program, of course, as you well know. We're going to be talking about ec the basic ECMO cannulation strategies and ECMO staffing and ECMO specialists. So tomorrow, 7 o'clock, same time, same station. Thanks for being with us today. We appreciate all of you. We'll see you later. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. 
venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the easy flow duo for arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation the easy flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual-stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high-flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point-of-care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes.
Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today.